Yes, I was wondering what to speak about tonight, uh, particularly as really during the week uh, very much our mind has been occupied with uh, yesterday's meeting and all that was to take place there. Obviously praying a great deal about it because it was uh, probably, well, the biggest meeting in a sense I think we've probably had um, uh, as uh, IFB. And, uh, uh, and then at the end, having prepared for uh, speaking uh, yesterday, uh, bringing the final message, I just began to think a bit about today and wondered what I might speak about. Half wondered whether to continue on from uh, yesterday, uh, but uh, felt that perhaps we might have a change of tack. Uh, David obviously addressed things this morning for us to consider as we come up to the referendum, and that was good and absolutely right. Uh, but I suddenly realized today was Father's Day. And uh, therefore I thought it was good just to reflect on the fatherhood of God uh, so that we might have a greater understanding of what our relationship can be to God. It's all through Jesus Christ, of course, who brings us into that relationship with God. Actually, Jesus, he said in that high priestly prayer uh, that uh, we tend to call it anyway in John chapter 17, I have given them your name. And uh, you may think, well, what name did Jesus give uh, to his followers? Well, I don't think you have to look very far in the rest of John's Gospel to realize that the name that Jesus particularly conveyed to us, remember that in the Old Testament it was Yahweh to a large extent, or El Shaddai, or Adonai perhaps, uh, uh, or Hashem, the name, uh, so there wasn't um, an understanding, particularly, there is a few references, there are a few references in the Old Testament uh, to God being Father. But they're very remote. But the one name that Jesus mo uses more than any other concerning God is Father. In fact, there's 99 references in John's Gospel alone to God being Father. Uh, some of them where Jesus is praying and says, my, my Father or Holy Father. Uh, but in the majority of cases, he's speaking to us in terms of God being Father. And of course, you know, the Lord's Prayer that he gave us immediately starts, Our Father who art in heaven. And um, do remember it is a prayer that he taught his disciples. I don't think it's a prayer uh, for basically school assemblies. Uh, because those children haven't come into a relationship with God the Father, or God as Father. Uh, we do that through Christ. And of course, the, the, the reason why I say that is if you consider Romans chapter 8, it talks there about um, uh, the Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are children of God. That's Romans 8 and verse uh, Verse 16. And he's really talking about when we come to a relationship uh, with God through Jesus. And he says just before that, he says, For you have not received a spirit of slavery leading again to fear, but you have received a spirit of adoption as sons by which we cry out, Abba, Father. I never forget the first time when I heard that, uh, that Hebrew word. Back in 1979, uh, first time I went to Israel, we had gone down to the Dead Sea, and uh, I heard a lad running across the, 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 the shore there, crying out, Abba, Abba! Mm -hmm. And he was so excited, and I thought, wow, mm -hmm. you know, my relationship can be like that with God. Although I think we need to remember that even Jesus re uh, addressed God as Holy Father. There is a difference. He is a perfect Father. He is without sin. And, uh, well, we are sinful people and we need that sin dealt with with Christ. And then when it is, that cry of the Spirit really within us, the Holy Spirit, touching our spirit, so that we cry, Abba, we know that God is our Father. We've been adopted as children into His family. Some of you who have been with us over the years will know that uh, I once had the privilege on College Sunday uh, preaching in the Metropolitan Tabernacle in London, uh, the area where Spurgeon had preached. Uh, that uh, church was destroyed during the war, uh, but it was a real privilege uh, to, to, to speak there. And on the way home, uh, went for 
uh, lunch with the family. Uh, you know, it's quite customary to have the preacher for lunch. Uh, don't normally carve you up too much no. anyway. But, uh, um, but on the way, these two children were telling me how they had been adopted. And they said, you know, our mum and dad went right across London and they chose us. And they had felt they were special. And I think the parents had dealt with that marvellously. Uh, so that they could feel in a, in a way that they hadn't been rejected by perhaps their uh, real mother, blood mother. But they, had been, they were special. God took hold of you. All right. He needed your response. He needed your willingness. I don't suppose the kids were uh, too bothered, really, who uh, adopted them in one sense that they were going to a family was the chief thing. But, of course, we can accept God as our Father, if you like, through Jesus as Saviour and Lord. Or we can reject it. And if we haven't come into a saving relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ, we're not really in a relationship with God as Father. So I think that's very important. In fact... I think it's borne out in another uh, verse that I think we often ignore, and particularly when we preach the gospel, we don't ever, I don't ever remember hearing a gospel message based on this, but I think it would be quite appropriate, because in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, it says there, in verse 17, Therefore come out from their midst to be separate, says the Lord, and do not touch what is unclean, And I will welcome you, and I will be a father to you, and you shall be sons and daughters to me, says the Lord Almighty. And uh, what this is really saying is that we, we, we need to make a response. Just before, of course, he's been talking about, and now is the day of salvation. And now is the accepted time. And he's saying to the church there, and I think he feels there's some in that church that really don't know the Lord yet, by their reaction to certain things, he feels there's something wrong. He appeals to them to be reconciled to God. And then he goes on to point out that really, if we're going to know that uh, father relationship, we need to come out of, if you like, the world. We need to repent. We need to leave the past behind. And God says, then I will be a father to you. Because really... He's not going to force himself upon us. He's waiting for us to come. He's waiting for us to be reconciled with him. So that uh, the fault is all on our side. But then we can know him as father. So I thought that was the first thing that we might uh, just bear in mind. We perhaps talk about the fatherhood of God. Um, all right, he's the father of our Lord Jesus Christ by the relationship there. In a sense, he has created all mankind, and we might say, therefore, he's the, the father of humanity. But uh, that real relationship with God the Father uh, means that we need to come through our Lord Jesus Christ. Obviously, one of the things that we would bear in mind in the whole matter of a relationship between father and child is that matter of love. And again, this is something I've stressed uh, very often over the years, because I think it's very important that we just focus on these words. In 1 John chapter 3 and verse 1, See how great a love the Father has bestowed on us, that we should be called the children of God, and such we are. And uh, he goes on to mention other things, of course, but... How great a a love the Father has bestowed upon us that we're not only called children of God, we are children of God. We're in that right relationship with the Holy Spirit having uh, brought about that new birth, uh, brought us in uh, adoption, if you like, into God's family so that we can know the love of the Father. And we need to sometimes meditate on this. Because I think uh, we would feel far more secure if we really allowed that word to penetrate deep within our hearts and minds. We have the love of the Father. It was that awful event, wasn't there, during the week when uh, in Florida at uh, the Disney World, uh, that uh, child was taken, that uh, lad was taken by an alligator, and the father wrestled with the alligator. The love of a father, I think actually... Uh, the love of a mother in that respect is even uh, more uh, deep. Uh, the mother instinct, as it were, to preserve the child. But 
I guess if you had asked the father whether he would be prepared to lose his arm to save his child, he would have been. He would have made that sort of sacrifice. As it was, he did all that he could as he rescued with that, uh, uh, wrestled with that alligator. But in so many ways, God has set his love upon us, watches over us, cares for us. That comes out very clearly as Jesus uh, is teaching there in the, uh, what we call the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 6. And having gone through those Beatitudes and other things, he comes right down to very practical matters. And he asks us why we're worried. Why we allow anxiety to grip us. And uh, he says, well let's read it. uh, Verse 25 of Matthew 6. Matthew 6 verse 25. For this reason I say to you, Do not be worried about your life as to what you will eat or what you will drink, nor for your body as to what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air, that they do not sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not worth much more than they? And who of you, by being worried, can add a single hour to his life, or span, or a cubit? Uh, That's something of the idea. (laughs) By worrying, you can't grow taller. Mm -hmm. And by worrying, you certainly can't add any time to your life. You'll probably shorten it, Mm -hmm. end up with ulcers or something like that. Uh, Something that will be damaging to your health depression even, and we've heard something of the problems that that might lead to. So Jesus is saying, why do you worry? It's no benefit to you. And after all, your father cares for the birds. He's provided seed and food in the general provision of things. Are you not worth much more than the birds? After all, Jesus died for you. Didn't die to redeem the birds, I'm sorry, but I don't think there are any animals in heaven particularly. They haven't got a soul. But he died for you. Goes on to say, uh, And why are you worried about clothing? I suppose these days it's not such a problem for us. Uh, You know, nobody goes without money. We've If we don't have a job or if we're too ill to work, we we get benefits, so we have some money, but things could be pretty desperate in Jesus' time. Mm -hmm. And he says, why are you worried about clothing? Observe how the lilies of the field grow. They do not toil, nor do they spin. Yet I say to you that not even Solomon in all his glory uh, has clothed himself like one of these. The lilies of the field. I don't know if you saw the uh, Chelsea Flower Show, but there was one there that was based on Jordan, and uh, uh, I think they had uh, poppies, but in the process uh, of talking about it, he had wanted to uh, bring some anemones into the, the garden. Uh, Di will remember that uh, she helped to look after David and our kids. We all went as a family to Israel, um, because having been several times... Um, I prayed that it would be possible to uh, take the family, particularly I wanted Belle to go. And uh, somebody made it possible by a gift. And we went and uh, with four children, uh, it was, uh, David was four months old at that time. Uh, it was a bit of a handful traveling around, all traveled around in the car, uh, which was quite uh, something. Uh, but we were down uh, towards the desert in the south near Beersheba and we saw what we thought were poppies at first, bright red, and we got out and looked, and there were actually anemones. Mm-hmm. I don't think I've ever seen an anemone so beautiful. Mm-hmm. Uh, they really were splendid. Considered to be the lilies of the field. They weren't cultivated, they were wild. Mm-hmm. There was nothing man had added to them, but they were splendid. And they just 
haven't struggled, they just naturally grew and developed. God says, he's provided for them, he's made them. Why do you worry about your clothing? Isn't he able to provide for you? So he goes on to say, if God so clothes the grass of the field which is alive today and tomorrow is thrown into his furnace, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? Do not worry then, saying, what will we eat, or what will we drink, or what we will wear for clothing? For the Gentiles eagerly seek all these things. For your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Get your priorities right, he's saying, in one sense. (coughs) And how we get our priorities out uh, out of sync. David was reminding us as a nation we chase after wealth and everything. Uh, that's something of our gods almost these days. Uh, that uh, we worship pleasure and, uh, and sex and all sorts of things it would seem. But Jesus is saying, get your priorities right. God take care of the rest. This is the important thing. The kingdom of God. Your eternal destiny. God knows what you need. Father, I guess, a good father understands something of the needs of his children. So he goes on, so do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will take care of itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own, what Jesus is saying. Just live a day at a time in one sense with the problems that come along. Ask God to help you for what you're facing today. And God knows, and God will help you. And it's not just in those physical areas, because just the next chapter on, he talks about um, asking. In verse 7, and it will be given to you, seeking you will find, knock and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and he who seeks finds, and to him who knocks it will be opened. And then he goes on to say, what man is there among you who, when his son asks for a loaf, will he give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, he will not give him a snake, will he? If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give what is good to those who ask him? And of course, in uh, Luke's Gospel, it talks about giving the Holy Spirit to those who ask him. Much the same wording is there. And, uh, of course, God knows full well that we need the Holy Spirit if we're going to live the Christian life. So it's not only our physical needs, it's not only to help us as we face all sorts of things and, um, and just look to God for help, but the Holy Spirit is there to help us with our living. As I said, there's only one or two references in the Old Testament, and uh, one is found in Isaiah 64. And there compares uh, God as Father with a potter who fashions. Isaiah 64 and uh, verse 8. But now, O Lord, you are our Father, we are the clay, and you are our potter. And all of us are the work of your hand. Actually, it does go on to say about the state they've got into as a nation and the disaster they're facing. And basically what they're saying is, you've founded us as a nation. And of course, Israel is a special nation, uh, much more than uh, the British nation, because uh, God was using this people to prepare the, the world for Messiah to come and for the salvation of the world. And, uh, but they were making the appeal to God to, to do something rather along the lines of what uh, Isaiah, uh, Jeremiah had seen when he had gone to the potter's house, when God refashioned uh, a pot that he was making. And God was saying that he could do that with Israel, but actually, because Israel was disobedient, he was going to bring judgment upon them, and he was going to fashion them for calamity. But here the, the idea is much more that You are our Father. Lord, will you shape us as a nation? And I found myself thinking, yes, uh, you know, in some ways, we as fathers do help to fashion our our sons and daughters. 
some go to extreme lengths. They almost want to live out in their children their own dreams and force it upon them. Uh, some want to uh, make uh, their children in their own image, as it were. I suppose to some extent we're fashioned by our families and by the world around us, sadly sometimes the environment that is around us. Uh, but we get certain things from our parents. Um, I have quite a love of football and I think in some ways that uh, came from my father. Uh, I went up to uh, see Portsmouth play uh, very regularly with him at Fratton Park. Uh, those were the glory days for Portsmouth. Uh, for two seasons running, we were uh, uh, top of the first division as it was then, the Premiership now. And uh, uh, remember seeing Portsmouth play Arsenal and beat Arsenal and so on. And, uh, uh, and so we'd go on. My, my dad used to play football when he was a lad on a Saturday morning. And unknown to his father, he played rugby in the afternoon. Now, somehow that matter of rugby seems to have missed out a generation and gone to a, uh, somebody else. But uh, and I had no uh, part in shaping him to play rugby, but uh, there it is. But there are certain things where, in a way, we're fashioned, and rightly so, because uh, we're, we're taught certain things, we're shown what is right and wrong. And uh, so our lives, to some extent, are fashioned by those around us. But, you know, God wants to fashion your life and mine. And he has a, a purpose for your life. And, you know, just as various vessels by the potter are created differently, he may make a series of uh, uh, pots that are much the same, but will fashion all sorts of different vessels in different ways. And God wants to fashion your way, he, uh, your life. He knows what is best for you, and He knows what you can accomplish. And He never asks you to do more than you are able. But do remember that you're able to do more than you think, because God is able to help you. How much are you yielding to the hands of the potter? Are you resisting God? <coughs> He wants to fashion your life into something of beauty, something of wonder, something of amazement. Something to be a vessel in the master's hands, as it's put in elsewhere, so that he can use you to his glory and honor, but again, to your, to your satisfaction in one sense. The other thing uh, that perhaps uh, we may not like to talk about quite so much is that um, fathers have to discipline children. Uh, I don't know whether you've noticed that, but they're not quite perfect, nor fathers for that matter, uh, except one, one father that's perfect. Uh, I remember being disciplined a bit from time to time. I remember that uh, we went out as uh, some scouts uh, just on our own and uh, went hiking, probably pushed it further than we should have done, and I got home pretty late at night, gone 10 o'clock, and they were worried stiff, and I was grounded for a week. Um, probably. They said, why couldn't you have phoned? Well, yes, I suppose I could have done, but it never entered my head that uh, we just wanted to get back, realizing we we're going to be late, get back as quickly as we, uh, we could. But uh, no mobile phones, it would have meant fi finding, a, finding a phone box, which probably wasn't so easy out in the country anyway. But, yeah, a bit thoughtless. Remember another occasion, I don't know what I'd done wrong, but I was ready. Um, but Dad didn't use a belt on me too often, but this particular day he was going to. But... I was a little bit quicker than him, and I got into the toilet and locked the door. And um, I think my mother was a little bit amused, and that probably saved me from something of the wrath of my dad. Uh, uh, so I may have escaped a little. But it actually talks rather along those lines in Hebrews uh, 12. He says, uh, my son, do not regard, and this is verse 5, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor faint when you are re reproved by him. For those whom the Lord loves, he disciplines, yes. and he scourges every son whom he receives. It is for discipline that you endure. And he's talking now about, we'll come to this again in Hebrews, this whole matter of enduring. Enduring by faith. We've 
begun to start on this matter. It, it came up at the end of chapter 10. It runs right the way through chapter 11 uh, and comes up again in very much in chapter 12. So he's saying in one sense, the hardship that you may be experiencing as Christians actually helps you to mature. It's not going to wrap you up in cotton wool. But he does go on to say, God deals with you as sons. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? And if you are without discipline, of which we have all become partakers, then you are illegitimate children and not sons. Fathers don't always care for well, wrong relationships that uh, pass uh, in the night, as we might say. Uh, but a real son they care for. Sadly, these days there are far too many pa- fathers around to have no real relationship with their, mm. with their children. In the past, that very rarely happened mm. because it wasn't considered that right to have uh, sexual relationships outside of marriage. Mm. And there's something of that ideal here. And so if you were a proper son, the father would have to discipline you. He would discipline you. Part of his love for you to bring you up in the right way. And he's saying that's, that's true with God. Furthermore, we had earthly fathers to discipline them. And we respected them. Shall we not much rather be subject to the father of spirits and live? For they disciplined us for a short time as seemed best to them. That's true. Didn't always get it right. But he disciplines us for our good, so that we may share his holiness. All discipline for the moment seems not to be joyful, but sorrowful. Yet to those who have been trained by it, afterwards it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness. God disciplines us in various ways, sometimes by his word, sometimes by other people who are concerned for us, uh, uh, just correcting us when we perhaps go into error or when we start to uh, behave in a wrong way, when we allow the world's standards to come into our lives and so on. And sometimes when we don't uh, listen uh, in those ways, God may have to use more forceful means to get our attention. I'm not going to go into the details so that he might use, but uh, God wants our attention. And sometimes he has to deal pretty strongly with us because we're stubborn and willful, as, of course, some children are. But that discipline is is useful. And then, uh, of course, just to add uh, James uh, chapter 1, the reminder that God is a perfect Heavenly Father, whereas we're not perfect. And it says there in verse 17, every good, thing, every good thing given and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow, a shifting shadow. And uh, he points out that uh, just a little bit earlier in verse 13, let no one say when he is tempted, I'm being tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil, and he himself does not tempt anyone. Comes from within us to sin and temptation. He's the father of lights. Absolutely pure, and not a hint of any darkness, not a hint of any sin in his life. And we're called into a relationship with God like this. And even just touching on some of these uh, aspects, I don't think we can fully appreciate how much God wants to be in relationship with us. Mm. And how much God can fashion us, shape our lives, so that they really become something of value and worthwhile and something of beauty. I had a number of cards uh, from uh, from my children today, a couple of them humorous. Uh, one just a matter of acknowledging that it was Father's Day and wishing me a happy Father, a happy Father's Day. And one just said, "Thank you for your help. I wouldn't have got through without you." Mm. And you and I wouldn't have got through without the help of the Father. And He wants to be there and help you. And yeah, He's not going to wrap you up in cotton wool. 
you know, we, we train up our kids. Uh, uh, Rosanna does a lot of baking, you know, her mum could have said, oh, no, no, you're not, uh, not going to do that. You can't get all flour on your hands or anything like that. And uh, Mike might have said to the kids, oh, no, you know, I'm in your punches and, uh, uh, and all the rest of it. But a father trains us up. And God wants to train us up so that uh, we are really effective. So again, let me ask you, how much are you yielding to the potter's hands? Because he wants to fashion your life. And yes, sometimes it means that he has to discipline us. But he knows all that we're going through and he cares for us. Father, we want to thank you again that... We can call you Father. And Lord, it's not just words that we're called the children of God. But we are that. It is a relationship, a living relationship. Father, we ask again that you will help us so that that relationship won't get strained because we have some way uh, misbehaved, not listening, rebellious and stubborn. But rather, Lord, we will come under that that care Mm. of the Father. Mm. And know your advice, your leading, your help, your strengthening. Mm. Giving to us again the Holy Spirit. Mm. So, Lord, we ask, help us, we pray, Mm. in our relationship with you. And, Lord, help us to rest much more in your love and care. Mm. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Mm. Amen.